for my sermon greeting this morning, I don't go to the regular greetings that Paul uses in his letters. Instead, we use the one we heard from the book of Revelation. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. From the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is our God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our sermon message this morning is based on those words from the beginning of the book of Revelation. They're in front of you. You can look at them as you wish on page 4 and page 5 in the bulletin. When I was a kid, about 8th grade or so, I don't remember exactly when, but I'm thinking later middle school, I went through a phase where I was obsessed with medieval ages, middle ages, kings kinds of things. Kings who rode at the front of their armies with swords and weaponry of all different kinds, catapults, stuff like that. But, but, but that eventually sort of gelled into a focus on one particular set of myths and legends. I was obsessed with King Arthur. Right? King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, Sir Bors and Sir Gawain and, and the overrated Lancelot, right? all, of, all of those things. I, I loved all of it. I, I read the new books that were just coming out at the time including some I wouldn't recommend anymore. And I even read a book that was 500 years old at the time by, by Sir Thomas Mallory, who's a Frenchman. He wrote, originally wrote that book called Le Mort de Arthur in the 1400s. It was translated, <laughs> but it's still tough. I loved it. And, and one of the, the wonderful things about the, the legend of King Arthur was that it connected to today, at least according to legend. Right? Arthur was this king who had risen up and saved the people of Britain from the barbarians and the enemies, blah, 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 whatever. But he was also supposed to come back. Right? The legends would say of a, of a time when Excalibur would return and Arthur would come back from the mists, so much so that Arthur's title became the once and future king. Well, as I prepared for our service this week, and thought about Christ our King, those memories came back, even watched a terrible King Arthur movie this weekend. And it got to me thinking that, that on Christ the King Sunday, we might be tempted to give Christ that title. Right? The once and future King. Christ who, who at one time defeated death. Shattered the, the plans and, and, and power of Satan on Easter Sunday morning, and the king who promises that he will return in the future. We've been talking about that these last three Sundays. And then his reign will never end. And for a while, that was actually the, the working theme of my sermon as I was putting the pieces together and, and thinking about what parts of this section of Revelation I would share with you and talk about more. And then it occurred to me that. That title applies to Arthur, but not to Christ. Because Christ wasn't just a king in the past, and he isn't just going to be a king again in the future. He is our king right now. He's still running all things for us. As, as John said at the beginning of, of this section in the book of Revelation, Jesus is the one who is and who was and who is to come. It's repeated twice in this section. Not the once and future king. The once and always king. And that is the one that we gather to worship every Sunday. That is the one we, we especially gather and celebrate on this Christ the King Sunday. A king who will always be king for us. And so turn to this last book of scripture with me and marvel again at our Savior Jesus. Because here in just these short verses, God shows us the nature of our king. But he also shows us our purpose and our future as well. Take a look. As John begins writing down this revelation that was given to him by Jesus, he begins with a familiar greeting. Right? It, it's, it's kind of what I referenced in the sermon greeting. We, we're used to hearing Paul begin his letters by saying, grace and peace to you. And then he usually continues with, with sort of a generic, right, from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or, or some way of doing that. But, but here in this book of Revelation, the Spirit inspires him to, to go into more depth. He talks about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but he, he kind of hints more at the Trinity. 
God, the eternal, unchanging Father, who very well could be described as the one who is and was and is to come. Though we're going to apply that more broadly to Christ as well. And then he describes God the Holy Spirit, right? Grace to you from the seven spirits before the throne. We talked about this in our Bible study in Revelation a number of weeks ago, right? Probably better to translate it the sevenfold spirit of God before the throne. And most commentators here then see a reference to Isaiah 11, where the spirit of the Lord is described with seven qualities, right? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, fear of the Lord. And, and it would make sense to refer to the spirit that way at the beginning of a book that takes spiritual wisdom and understanding and knowledge to understand. But here on this day, it's Revelation's description of Jesus that captures our attention. Here we're reminded of our king's nature. John describes him as the faithful witness, the firstborn from among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Three titles, three jobs. Some of you might remember who are in catechism class now or, or have been in catechism class not so long ago that you've forgotten everything, that when we teach this in catechism class or when I go through this with new members or prospects for membership, when we're talking about the work that Jesus does, we divide it into three offices, three roles that he fulfilled. I don't know which pastor originally came up with that division, but it very well might have come from these verses right here. We see all three of these roles, Jesus as prophet, as priest, and as king. What was a prophet's job in the Old Testament? Really nothing more complicated than to tell people what God said. And isn't that what Jesus did his whole life? He went to them telling them that the Savior that God had promised through all those other prophets had now arrived and and in fact was standing right in front of them. Jesus was the perfect prophet, the faithful witness, as he's called here. Jesus as priest? Well, what did priests do in the Old Testament? They offered the sacrifices, right? The people would bring their animals to the priests and and the priests then would do all of the ritual things to, to, to put that animal on the altar. But there was a whole lot more to it than that. Priests in the Old Testament had to wear special clothes before they could do the work of their office. They, they had to purify themselves before they could approach God at the altar. The whole system was designed to remind the people that their sin separated them from God and that it would take blood, it would take death, to bring them back to him. But the book of Hebrews has a whole chapter too, in fact, that talk about how Jesus was a better priest than all of those priests of the Old Testament. Jesus was better because he was pure on his own, blameless. He didn't have to offer sacrifices before coming to God on our behalf. Jesus was a a better priest because he could approach God without sin because he kept the law perfectly. He had never sinned. And not only was he a better priest in the office, he was the better sacrifice too. The priest shed the blood of animals, Jesus shed his own, put to death not for his own sin but for ours. But here in this role of priest, Jesus is called the firstborn from the dead. You see, unlike all those Old Testament prophets, Jesus' sacrifice didn't end in death. No animal ever came off of the burnt offering or the sin or the guilt or the fellowship offering in the Old Testament. Every sacrifice ended in death. Jesus? Well, Jesus came back to life. But not as the last to rise, as the first. Jesus' resurrection served as proof of his victory, but it also serves as proof of his power to raise us. Yes, on on the last day, we too will be raised, and every believer that trusts in Christ for salvation will praise our perfect Savior forever in heaven from that moment for 10,000 years upon 10,000 years. The perfect priest, the firstborn from the dead. Prophet, priest, and king. 
Scripture calls Jesus here the ruler of the kings of the earth. And, and he deserves that title simply because of who he is, doesn't he? By, by virtue of being God himself, he, he has power over all the world. But he also deserves this title by the work that he did. There are no enemies left to stand against our king, Jesus. Jesus conquered sin. He destroyed death with his sacrifice on the cross and his return to life. He, he shattered Satan's plans to take all people to hell with him. And those enemies that we have, those spiritual enemies, they still lash out at us, sometimes painfully, like wounded animals, mortally wounded. I learned a long time ago, you never walk up to a buck after it's been shot so you know it's done. And there are still things that hurt us in this world that cause us sadness, grief. And the devil and the world, our, our sinful nature, they bring us pain and they bring us difficulty. But, but make no mistake, Christ our King is still ruling with full power and authority from his throne in heaven. Think of the promises that he gives, not to keep evil away from us, but to bring us through it. To always be with us no matter what we face. To, to turn every possible evil out for our eternal good. Every dark time promised to end in green pastures beside quiet waters. Yes, this world is tough. And it can be tough. But never doubt that our Savior is watching. He loves us. And he knows us. And he blesses us. And, and no matter what it is that pulls us towards sorrow or anxiety or fear, Jesus has already defeated it and Jesus rules over it for our good in the end. No wonder the Spirit breaks in after this three-part description of who Jesus is. We get this interruption in the flow of the text. It's as if the Holy Spirit himself couldn't do anything but pray Jesus, praise Jesus in that moment. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins, to him be glory and power forever and ever. We're blessed to know God's nature as well. And we respond in outbursts of praise the same way. We worship the once and always king. As we celebrate him this morning, and as we look at these words from Revelation chapter 1, though, don't fail to notice his direction for our work for him. We find our purpose in life revealed in these verses. Why are we here? What does life mean? Philosophers and, and, and atheists may wonder, but we know Jesus freed us for the purpose that we see in verse 6 here. It says he has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. Every king rules over a people. And our once and always King Jesus is no different. We are members of the kingdom of God already now, living under his protection and salvation like I talked about with the kids. Someday, our king will gather us together and take us to be with him in the perfect kingdom forever. But for now, we wait. But while we wait, God gives us a purpose. He has made us priests to serve him. And as priests, the sacrifices that we bring to God aren't animals at an altar, not even offerings in a plate necessarily. We sacrifice our hearts. We bring to God our repentance, our prayers and our praises, our love for others, our love for him. We offer our whole selves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, and, and we praise God for the opportunity to do that in Christ. But if we're truly to be priests in this world, might I suggest that we probably, likely need to offer him more than we're offering right now. I'm guilty of it too. I tell myself far more than I would like any of you to know my time off is my time off to spend the way I want to spend it. My, my blessings are my own to use as I see fit. And I know that you say the same thing too. God will wait, we tell ourselves. But how selfish is that? How backward, how sinful. Think ahead just to this coming week. And ask if the way you plan to spend your time and energy shows service to God 
or service to something else. And, and this is a week when we have an extra day off of work and away from school and all of those other things that pull us in a thousand directions. It's pretty easy to forget our purpose, isn't it? Why God leaves us here. God does not put you in this world for you to be happy. Not all the time. He doesn't give us time and energy to gather more for ourselves and give less to others and to him. To offer ourselves, he puts us here to serve him. To offer ourselves for his work, to devote ourselves to his mission. If, if you find yourself unsatisfied with life, don't be surprised if a part of that is that you have wandered from the one thing that gives this life meaning. Our connection with Christ our King. So repent and know that you are forgiven. Christ our King has paid for our sins, including our sins of hypocrisy. So take up your cross again and follow him. Dedicate yourself to God's purpose. Study the word. Show love to others. Share your faith. Serve with us here at church. And then know that we serve our King in this life because we know our future in the next. God reminds us about that again in verse 7. He says, look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Our king is coming back. And when he returns, there will be no mistaking it. Every eye will see it this time. Every knee will bow up before him. On that knee, no one will be able to deny the fact that Jesus is the king of kings, not even those who pierced him with nails by Roman hands. But that number of those who pierced him, it doesn't just include Roman soldiers and Jewish leaders. It includes every unbeliever who crucifies Christ again by rejecting him and his love for them. Every sinner who adds to the suffering that Christ had to experience on the cross because of our sin and our selfishness and our spiritual laziness. That day in the future, we will realize the, the truth of what Jesus says here. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Who is, who was, who is to come. Alpha and Omega. They're the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And whether you know it or not, you've seen them. You see them every week. They're the two letters above the Lamb on our altar. Jesus is the beginning and the last. There is no God but him. No God but the true God. No king but our Savior Jesus. And above all things, we know that he won for us the perfect victory when he finished his work on the cross and rose victoriously on Easter Sunday. He's ruling right now in perfect power as he holds a leash on the devil and the world. As he sets limits on just how far they can go against us. We worship Christ, the once and always King. The eternal one who one day will return in power to, to bring his final blessings to God's people. The one who is truly King of kings and Lord of lords. To him be the glory, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God which is beyond our understanding, guard and keep our hearts in Christ our King. Amen.